Galaxy 666 by Pell Toro. Session 55. Welcome back, fellow travelers, to Galaxy 666, your guide to here. Korzak's turn to be the focus in a short chapter 16. In this chapter, Korzak walks downstairs. And that's all. There's quite a lot of discussion about the stairs and even some description about them, but at the end of the day, he took a chapter and walked down some stairs. This gives us a couple points of interest, actually. First, Korzak walked down stairs. This means he can walk and that there is a down, and that there are stairs. Walking requires gravity and brings us back to the issue we drew on at the end of Session 53. Down means there's a consistent direction of gravity and that the ship was not used to its shifting. The tread of the stairs was only by his feet, not also by his head, indicating a one-way system. And they were stairs, a tool for moving between the floors when under gravity, and something you will not find on the International Space Station. The best part of the chapter was focused on what Korzak felt like, and there were two issues with this. The first, and this may be owed to the fact that I was born and raised in America, or am not overly familiar with some colloquialisms, but I really have no idea what it would feel like to be truth at the bottom of a well. The saying refers to the idea that truth is very difficult to know. The saying does not seem to fit here at all. The next two things Korzak feels like are the same and beg the question, why use them both? Of course, if you look up a spiral staircase, it is very unlikely that you would feel like either a splinter or a worm about to be cut by a drill bit, as you are already standing on the blade of the drill bit itself, to wit, the stairs. You couldn't have this impression that Pell references unless you are standing below a spiral staircase and the staircase starts above you. Of course, if this were the case, what good is the staircase as you can't even reach the first step? As we have covered quite fully before, Pell's main failure in bringing this world to life for us is his lack of description. But the author cannot describe what they can't sense either. The author must first be in this place themselves, and in their own mind feel it, smell it, hear it, taste it. The more real it is to them, the more likely they will be to pull out salient and meaningful details to provide to the reader. During this soiree through the alien ship, we have seen a few items, a strange mesh, a heavy door, and a staircase, but we don't get a sense of what it was like moving along the corridors. And when we are given some ideas, such as during Oski's portion, it doesn't match up with the physics that the others have experienced. Lionel, during his Badger days, had more of a focus on ideas and plot points than storytelling or an effort to immerse the reader in another world. World building is a complex and time-consuming process. Will there be currency? Will there be religion? Will there be nation-states? Languages? A history? Different races? Creatures? Not to mention character backstories and carefully built-up towns, offices, houses, and other locations where the action will take place. To create all that world in one go, and to keep it in one's mind so that it is constantly referred to during the narrative, is more of writer's fantasy than reality. J.R.R. Tolkien worked religiously on the language and the lore of Middle-earth before creating the Lord of the Rings trilogy, as did J.K. Rowling for Harry Potter, or Frank Herbert for Dune. When under the Badger time crunch, all this important background work is skipped and we end up with far less description and far more recitation of personal philosophy and random trivia. Those items are easy enough to pull from memory. But even though a writer may tap their own memory or philosophy as they write, they must first and foremost take the reader by the hand and guide them through the story. Consistent rules in the story. The six-shooter can't shoot seven bullets. Rich description that employs all the senses. Reporter-like focus on the facts that matter and advance the story. That is what is required. As a means of comparison, I'll read a passage from Sunlight on the Lawn by Beverly Nichols. I thought of Oldfield and those pears, and the darkness was suddenly lit by a host of happy memories. I thought of those enchanted, secret moments in the old fruit room next to the tool shed, and how I used to have to search for the key of it, which he always hid in the crevice of the wall, and how the key would not open the door unless you put it in upside down and pushed it very hard to the left. Then you opened the door and stepped inside. For a moment there was darkness and nothing but the perfume of the pears. There was the scent of Gloria de Camus from the Espalers in the kitchen garden and from the old arches against the south wall and of the gnarled, twisted trees of Williams in the orchard. 
I thought of summer mornings in February, sitting at the breakfast table, cutting a pear with a silver knife and marveling at the sweet summer juices that dripped onto the plate. That was a miracle that never lost its freshness. Here I was, in deep winter, and if I turned my head and looked over my shoulder, I should see white fields in a snowbound world. But in front of me, on a green plate, was the sweetness of the summer. By some enchantment of nature, the showers of April and the dews of June had been distilled into a magic living casket, and had been preserved through the long, bitter winter for my delight. Notice all the small details. The silver knife, the green plate, the juices, the aroma of the pears. That is the level of detail that we aspire to. So, shall we next hear the fate of Ishclaw? Will he walk down a hallway or do some other sort of crazy action? One way to find out for sure, we keep pressing into... Galaxy 666 Here ends Session 55